invite you uh, today to uh, uh, another instantiation of our, our speaker series and we're doing all year uh, long. We're broadcasting uh, live over the internet uh, to uh, listeners around the world. It's my particular pleasure today to welcome uh, our speaker, uh, Susan Jack from the University of uh, Miami, where she's Distinguished Professor in the Humanities, Cooper Senior Scholar in the Arts and Sciences, Professor of Philosophy, and Professor of Law. And she also asked me to highlight that she also uh, teaches a class there in, in Science and Values. She's the author of numerous books, um, all of which, it seems, have really fabulous um, titles. The author of Deviant Logic, that's the <laughs> manifesto of a passionate, moderate, unfashionable essays, defending science within reason, in scientism, cynicism. We have a number of um, sort of uh, handouts that highlight a number of her books, and uh, some of these talk if you're interested. And uh, Ben Wall is one, uh, uh, a, a compilation of her work entitled a lady of distinctions. So please join me in welcoming Susan Hack, who will address six signs of Okay. Um, ye gods, maybe I use this thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, it works. Uh, you know where you are. You, you what I'm talking about. All I have to say about my time is it's a good thing I have all my teeth, because it's impossible to say otherwise. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll sh I start with two quotations. They are, of course, pulling in opposite directions. That's the point. Um, the first is from Peirce from 1903. A man might, must be downright crazy to deny that science has made many true discoveries. He used once a paper on feminist philosophy of science and followed it by, or a woman. And then, on the other side, um, someone you probably haven't heard of, I hadn't heard of until I started thinking hard about scientism and what it was and what was wrong with it. A man called Hobbes, who wrote in the 50s a really very good book about scientism and why it was a bad thing. Scientism employs the prestige of science for disguise and protection. I think both of those claims are true. I want to understand, in part, how they fit. OK, well, the, the, the first things I shall say will be extremely familiar to those of you who've ever read Francis Bacon, um, and very remarkable even to the rest of you, I don't think. Um, I want to get my cards on the table right away. Science is a good thing. We are better off for having it than we would be without it, in my opinion. And it's a good thing because it brings both light, as Bacon would have said, that's to say, knowledge of the world, and fruit, that's to say, the ability to predict and to control the world. Um, if, if you've never read Daniel Defoe on the big year in London. Read him. It's really a very, very fine illustration of what it was that Bacon saw that was so important. You know, um, the streets of London are up to burying dead bodies, and the sound of, of thousands of people bewailing the dead. And People on street corners saying, repent, the end of the world is at hand. God is punishing us for something or other. But the point was, if you know how the world works, you can do something effective about, for example, the plague, instead of waiting for the great fire of London to do it for you. Okay, so that's my first card on the table. Second card, um, I don't think Bacon entirely appreciated this. Um, Oh, science is a good thing. Of course it's not a perfectly good thing. It's a human enterprise. 
all human enterprises are fallible, so are the sciences. The progress of the sciences, in my opinion, um, much philosophy of science to the contrary, is very ragged, very even, um, up to a point, really quite unpredictable. And moreover, some science isn't very good. You know, some of it's just new, but it's all dressed in fancy language. Some of it's really quite poorly conducted. And some, I probably encounter more of that as, as law professor than you might, but some of it's downright corrupt. Okay. I mean, I, I've actually read cases where scientists go to jail for having conducted fraud using federal science funds, for example. And neither, though science is certainly a good thing, a very good thing, is it the only good thing. Um, for one thing, there are plenty of other valuable forms of inquiry, besides scientific inquiry. And for another, there are plenty of other valuable human activities besides inquiry. You know, music, storytelling, joke telling. These are all things that human beings do. They're all good things. I would be worse off without any of them. Um, the subtitle of this book of mine um, was intended precisely to suggest that we need to avoid, on the one hand, underestimating the science, um, as I think a lot of sociologists of science in the period in which this book, at least, were inclined to do, and overestimating it. Um, the first of those faults is what I call cynicism about science. The second is scientism. Uh, when I wrote Defending Science, I, I have to say, uh, the sociological cynics were much on my mind. I'd been fighting them for years. Uh, and while I think it's clear to a sympathetic reader that the book was intended to be moderate in a certain sense, uh, some people actually accused me of scientism. I think because I was completely outspoken about the relations, as I see, between science and religion. Uh, and this made me think, you know, maybe it was time to write a paper explaining scientism is as bad a failing as cynicism about science. Uh, I did a little bit of digging um, about the word scientism and discovered, interestingly enough, um, the word used to mean, used to be entirely neutral, had no pejorative connotations at all, originally. It just meant the mode of thinking of a man of science. At around the time that the word, the English word, science, began to refer specifically to the sciences as we now call them, and not to mean just knowledge in general, we're aware of the etymology, I assume. It comes from skio, I know, in Latin. So originally it just meant knowledge. And in uh, mid 19th century, for example, you can find many books of jurisprudence, titles like The Science of Jurisprudence, which now seems like, what? What does that mean? Uh, but it was perfectly okay when it just meant any systematized body. Around that time, the word scientism turned pejorative. And now, as far as I can tell, it's almost entirely pejorative. It means being respectful of science in a way that's inappropriate, roughly. Um, I found one person uh, willing to describe himself scientistic and proud of it. Uh, but I think he is an aberration. And it's the, okay. As I use the word anyway, it's pejorative. It means being too uncritically uncritical of science. <laughs> so by my lights, that scientism is a bad thing is a trivial verbal truth. Okay. What's not trivial is, yeah, but what scientism? Okay. 
That's the question that seems to me to be in need of work. And that's the one I'm working on. Okay, here are my signs. Um, I might say I initially prepared this for a conference in China. Um, boy, was I lucky to have this slide. I, I asked them ahead of time, how long a paper? They said, oh, you know, it's length. Um, me, we've got a number of words. No, a number of poems. Oh, no, no, can't tell you. We have a usual length. So I wrote a usual length paper, and I made a usual length slideshow. And I flew to Beijing to find myself one of five people. OK, you have 12 minutes each. I think the others really hated me because I had this slide. <laughs> I could talk for two minutes about each point, <laughs> and I was under control. They, they, were, they were really sunk, poor thing. Anyway, um, I shall work through them systematically. But the first is the honorific use of words like science, scientific, scientific, scientist. Adopting scientific trappings not to do work, but for disguise. Uh, Excessive preoccupation with the problem of demarcation. Excessive preoccupation with the scientific method, actually, which usually grows capital letters in the hands of the scientist. Looking for scientific answers where scientific answers are not appropriate. And denigrating non-scientific inquiry and other activities besides inquiry. I'll take them in turn. Okay. Um, it seems to me increasingly commonly the words scientific, scientifically, etc., are used as, what do I mean, honorific terms. They're sort of generic epistemic praise. We don't say, do you have any good evidence for that? Is there any scientific evidence for that? Um, I even found a historian whom, whom I respect, uh, Mary Lefkowitz. In, in a, quite an interesting book, um, arguing that, oh, Aristotle did not steal his ideas from the Egyptians, that this is a mistake. Uh, and basically what she's doing is saying, look, you don't have any good evidence of that. And in fact, we have a considerable body of evidence that goes again. That's what she was saying. But what she came out with was, what these historians are doing is not scientific. Well, that just basically meant it's not good history. It's not good inquiry. That's what I mean. You also see this um, advertising. Um, I used to use a really old example. Many years ago in, in Britain, if I sound dogmatic, it's only because I'm British and we don't speak up speak, you know? So, OK. <laughs> um, in, in Britain, there used to be uh, a so-called biological detergent which allegedly ate the bacteria in your clothes. Uh, and used to be advertisements on television which said, you know, buy new scientific wizard, gets your clothes even cleaner. That's what I mean by the advertising use. There is now, you know, as of 2011, a new advertisement for a new detergent in the United States. It's a brand of whisk. And it says, new scientific whisk can detect the different kinds of stain and go attack them. You see, it's still going on. Uh, you also see this in the legal system. Uh, in 1993, the US Supreme Court made its first ever ruling on scientific testimony. Interesting, it had been in existence for 204 years. Uh, but only when science was coming into court more and more and more often was the Supreme Court finally obliged to say something on this subject. And what they said was, well, you know, what you, what you want it to be is really science. It means it's good, right? They're looking for a test of reliability. Well, is it really science? Um, if, if you press me, I'll tell you more of this story. It, it is bizarre, comical, if, if you're as well informed as I assume many of you are. Um, we want a test of reliability. OK, so we're looking for a test of what's genuine science. Who's got a criterion of what's genuine? Oh, Popper. Excuse me, but Popper will not use the word reliable without scare quotes. He doesn't believe in reliability. This was a big disaster. You also see this in the titles of conferences and books. 
Um, lots of them, but here's one that I feel I want to speak about because I was actually involved in, I was on the organizing committee of this conference, which was called The Flight from Science and Reason, held at the New York Academy of Sciences in 1996. And I can still remember in the meeting before the conference, as we were deciding whom to invite, and uh, say, could we please, please call it The Flight from Reason and Science? Because the title that you're giving it seems to me to imply that the sciences have a monopoly on reason. And that seems to me to be a mistake, and a serious philosophy of science sort of mistake. Uh, that's why my book is called Defending Science with Reason. To no avail. They said, and I still remember this, sorry, the New York Academy of Sciences is paying for this. Science has to come first. <laughs> okay. Uh, as soon as the word becomes honorific, and it is very much, I think, an honorific now, very commonly, uh, people who are not really comfortable about how rigorous their disciplines is, uh, start borrowing the word. Um, you know, our chemistry department doesn't call itself the Department of Chemical Science. Our physics department doesn't call itself the Department of Physical Science. But guess what? The business school has management science. <laughs> and there are degrees in library science, the University of Miami offers military science. I checked the curriculum because there's a possible interpretation on which that's legitimate. If they were doing you know, civil engineering, how to throw a bridge fast using the materials that are available, okay, that's fine. No, it's all about discipline and instilling the proper attitude, sir. So, uh, mortuary science, so far as I know, only one university ever offered it was the University of Minnesota. Okay. And the art of making corpses look. The point is, they're trying to borrow the word because they would like the prestige. That's the point. All of this makes it very easy to forget something very simple. Not all scientists are good inquirers. Some of them have been really, really good. But some of them have been mediocre, and some of them have been pretty bad. And not only scientists are good inquirers. There are good historians, good legal scholars, good literary scholars, and so on. Um, good philosophy for that matter. And I take philosophy to be a kind of inquiry. It all too easy to dismiss bad science as not really science at all. Um, it's so bad, it's not science, it doesn't include those science. Okay. And to assume that wasn't, wasn't science is thereby shown to be no good, or at any rate, not as good as if it were science. These are all bad consequences, in my opinion. Um, if I could abolish the honorific use, I would. But of course, it's not within my power. Okay. In fact, you know, the best scientific work is a great human cognitive achievement, no question. But it's fallible. There's plenty of good work in history, legal scholarship, music theory, you name it. There's also plenty of useful knowledge accumulated by people who are not, in any sense, academic or professionally inquiring, like you know, shipbuilders, fishermen, um, midwives, um, barefoot doctors. You remember, I was thinking of the Chinese text when I wrote this. Okay. And the honorific usage encourages another bad thing, namely uncritical credulity about scientific conjectures, even when they have no real evidentiary basis yet. Um, it was to see. At one level, I was amused. At another level, of course, it's very distressing. Uh, in your, your newspaper, the one that they put at my hotel door this morning, on the front page, 
was a reference to an article inside about Dr. Andrew Wakefield, um, who appears simply to have faked studies about MMR vaccine and autism, with consequences that you can see, first of all, through the legal systems in Britain, in Canada, in the US, and so on. Um, and, of course, consequences for public health. Because as soon as people stop vaccinating their children for these diseases, the rate of the diseases goes up. Right? The, the success of the program depends more or less on everybody joining in, or almost everybody. Okay. Uh, a lot of people fell that idea, even when it was purely speculative. After all, he's a scientist, he's a doctor, right? Got all these letters after his name. Okay. Uh, I would say, at this point in time, there is a huge body of very well warranted scientific theory, any of which might conceivably turn out to be false, but it's very unlikely. We would be awfully surprised. This big body of scientific knowledge is actually. You know, the surviving remnant of a simply enormous trash pile of ideas that didn't go anywhere. Right? The stuff that gets thrown out is vastly bigger than the stuff that survives. Second sign. Borrowing tools and techniques from the sciences, not because they'll do some important work for you, but because, well, you know, they look impressive. And people might think you're better than you are if you use this. Um, this isn't unheard of, even within the natural sciences. Um, I'll give you two examples I stumbled over. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a law professor. I'm in the very strange position of having come to this from philosophy. So unlike all my colleagues who read a case like this, oh, there's the bit I can use. I have to read every word. Um, and because I'm sort of obstinate, um, when they refer to scientific stuff, I often go and get the scientific stuff and read that to see what it actually said. Well, here are two examples I came across. Um, very influential study of a morning sickness drug called bendectin, suspect of causing um, limb reduction birth defects in fetuses. Um, uh, uh, probably suspected in large part because it was introduced to the market not long after the thalidomide disaster. Now, there was a drug that undoubtedly did cause horrible birth defects. One of the studies that the manufacturers kept trying out to show, look, you know, there's, there's no statistical evidence of this. The authors had failed to distinguish the women who took the drug during the period of pregnancy in which the limbs are forming and the women who took the drug before or after that period. Well, I don't need to tell you that if you design a study like that, the inevitable effect, you underestimate the effect of taking the drug on the occurrence of these birth defects. Well, you've got all this statistical number crunching, but the fact of the matter is they chose the sample wrong in the first place. Another case I was reading, um, actually, in advance of a law school class, uh, I'd, invited, I'd invited the chair of cardiology to come talk to my students because he's several times served as an expert witness in cases involving diet drugs uh, alleged to be bad for the heart. And it was good for the students to get some idea of what it's like to deal with a scientist. You know, so they don't know otherwise how to handle a witness. We learn all sorts of interesting things. For example, um, idea of causation and my students' idea of causation were completely different. Uh, but he said to me in the course of this, go have a look at that article about ephedra. This is the one that everybody cites. All the plaintiffs cite it. This is unbelievable. There's you know, all sorts of number crunching. And there's a table of a 30-year-old man um, no prior condition, takes ephedra, drops dead of a heart attack, and, and so on. You look at the table, it's completely incompatible with the text that accompanies it. And so this sort of fooling people with numbers and tables and whatnot 
happens in the sciences. Um, it's even worse in the social sciences. This is an old example, but I love it so much. You're going to get it anyway. This is from a book on, on criminal psychology. Criminal act is the sum of the person's criminalistic tendencies plus his total situation divided by the amount of his resistance. So there, you feel better, you understand it now, right? You know exactly what's going on. This is, this is mathematics to fool people. Right? The, appearance of, the appearance of rigor is a joke. Right? Okay. Um, I don't think philosophy is immune to this kind of scientism. Um, I suppose, I don't, I don't want to get too much on a hobby horse, but that name, date, page number citation system, which is borrowed from the social sciences, I think has had very, very bad consequences in philosophy. Um, for one thing, if you're trying to keep track of the history of an idea, it's catastrophic. For another, you, you, the number of people who cite an entire book for a point which maybe is and maybe isn't on one page somewhere in that book is getting more. It's infuriating. It's a kind of scientism, I think. Um, I think peer-reviewed publication works even less well in a field where you've got cliques and schools, which philosophy is certainly one, not the only one, but certainly one, than it does in the sciences. And it doesn't work terribly well in the sciences, I'm afraid. And I think um, a lot of philosophical technical terminology is kind of a sham. You know, the nice words are not doing anything. Just sort of sitting there looking pretty. Oh, look at me! But they're not doing any work. Um, those who know my work will know that I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm a neologizer. Um, I invent new words when I need them all the time. My ugliest coinage probably is foundationalism. That's the job. Uh, and there was a reason for it. It's not just decoration. But I think a lot of technical terminology is decoration. Okay. Um, now, I am not saying borrowing scientific tools is always a bad thing. Not at all. I'm saying borrowing them to look good is a bad thing. Borrowing them because they can do some real work for you, that's a good thing. Um, here are the examples. Um, historians that I read about borrowed a cyclotron from the physics department. It was, of course, you know, wasn't their best cyclotron. It was, for their purposes, it was a bit out of date. They had a better one. But what they didn't know was that they had some very old Bibles. And they wanted to know, first of all, are these before or after the Gutenberg Bible, which we can date fairly exactly? And can we guess whether they were printed by the same printer as the Gutenberg Bible? They used a cyclotron to determine the composition of the ink and were able to say these Bibles are earlier than the Gutenberg but were printed by the same person. Uh, there was a, you know, one of those sort of artificial scandals in the U.S. a few years ago when uh, a, a book made the claim that Thomas Jefferson was the father of all the seven children of one of his house slaves, Sally Hemings. That's the kind of thing that can be tested by mitochondrial DNA if you can get hold of the right material. And in due course, those tests were conducted. Um, the conclusion was that some male of the Jefferson family was the father of one of those seven children, though not of the other six. Um, whether it was Thomas or whether it was another male of the Jefferson family, we don't know. We don't know because mitochondrial DNA won't discriminate. And then, I'm very fond of this one, um, other historians borrowed um, a medical imaging device from the local school. It was designed to detect early stage breast cancer. What they used it for 
was to examine um, old Roman postcards. And of course, um, Roman soldiers, like soldiers anywhere, sent on campaign to distant places, want to write home. There aren't, of course, postcards made of card. There are lead tablets with wax on top on which you can write something with a stylus. Now, hundreds and hundreds of years later, the lead remains the wax. The lead has marks on it. Some of these marks are just the result of the thing being around for hundreds of years. Some of them are the faint images of stylus marks. They were able to read these postcards by using this medical imaging technology. Okay, third sign. Excessive preoccupation with the problem of demarcation. Um, it's kind of inevitable. When the honorific use is common, and there are a lot of people around borrowing scientific techniques in hopes of looking scientific, even though they aren't really, people get sort of antsy about demarcation. How do we tell whether it's really science or not? Um, I don't think it's an accident that um, this occupation with demarcation dates from roughly the time in which scientism is becoming pejorative. So, um, you know all this. The logical positivists thought that Verifiable was the mark of the empirical, empirically meaningful. Popper, far and away the most influential of the demarcationists, thought falsifiability was the mark of the scientific. Okay. Um, all right. Um, one of the papers that I offered Professor Barker that she didn't choose was called Just No to Logical Negativism. Right. This is the paper in. I say, look, I have finally had it with Popper. <laughs> I can take no more. It's a disaster. Can we just put it behind us? Okay. Um, so I'll be brief about this. And if anyone wants to know, you know where to find the citations and why I'm not making this up, ask me and I'll send you that paper. Okay. Um, I think both Popper's criterion and motivation for this criterion are profoundly <laughs> obscure. Popper's a very curious writer. There's a, a one level, very clear. A superficial level, it's very yeah. clear. Underneath the surface, it's almost impossible to penetrate. You can't get to what's... I mean, okay. It's because so many inco incompatible things are going on at once. Originally, Popper said, Marxism, Marxist sociology, scientific sociology, as they used to call it, is not science because it's not falsifiable. And then, in the open society and its enemies, he says, um, actually, it is falsifiable. And as a matter of fact, it was falsified by the events of the Russian Revolution. Uh, the problem is that they evaded falsification by modifying the theory as opposed to just dumping it. That means we've moved from a logical criterion to a methodological one, from one that applies to theories to one that applies to people. Um, as you may know, Popper can't make up his mind whether evolution is science or not. Right? Some, sometimes he says it's, it's, it's a metaphysical research program. Sometimes he says it's history. It's not science, it's history. Sometimes he says the survival of the fittest is a tautology. And then he changes his mind. Oh, well, actually, yes, it is a scientific theory. So this criterion is so clear, Popper can't apply it to a very important Central case, I would have thought. Uh, in the body of the logic of scientific discovery, he describes his criterion as a convention. So why should we care so much if we just, we're sort of deciding how to use the word science. There's nothing deeper than it. Well, but then why make such a big deal? And in the introduction to the English edition, he says, science is continuous with common sense knowledge. So we're making a conventional distinction somewhere along a continuum of, what's the point? Okay, you, you understand why I'm re re ready to dump Popper. <laughs> For 20 years at the University of Warwick, I had the office next door to David Miller. And I got Popper for breakfast, dinner, lunch, and tea. Uh, and only after I left was I able to get my head clear about Popper. Uh, and realized I'd been fooled for a long time. 
here's, here's what I now think about demarcation. It's not that you can't say anything about what distinguishes science from other things. Of course you can say something. I would say three things, three things sort of cumulatively. First of all, as I understand it, if, if, what, if work is science, it's a form of inquiry. If you're not inquiring, whatever you're doing, you're not doing science. That's the first thing. Second thing, uh, this is a matter of you know, the way the, world has, the word has gone in English. Uh, we don't long, no longer count pure mathematics as a science or logic. So into empirical subjects. And I think the third thing to say is there are lots of sciences, some of which are very intimately interconnected, and some of which, at the moment at least, are only rather loosely connected with each other. Think of it as like a federation, interrelated kinds of empirical inquiry. Beyond that, I don't think there's a lot to be said. Okay. You'll notice um, that is entirely neutral. It doesn't, it doesn't make science better than other things. It makes distinctions in, a, in an epistemologically neutral way. Um, I think we should also look for continuities. We're looking for distinctions. Um, a title I'm rather fond of, actually. I've used it twice already, which is a bit... I know you're not supposed to do that. I like it so much I've used it twice. The same, only different. It's a phrase my grandmother used to use when I was little. Um, my grandmother was a very interesting woman. Left school at the age of 12. Um, but she had a mind on it. And one of, one of the things she did for me was every day she and I would do all the word puzzles in the newspaper. I wonder where my crossword analogy came from. Uh, and when I asked her, you know, what's a so-and-so, Grandma? Oh, dear, what happened? Something happened that wasn't. It won't go back. Why won't it go back? Do I have to do something else? Do I have to use another gadget? Someone's going to have to help me with this. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I am not very good at this kind of thing. Can you go back to where we were. Okay, we should be looking for continuities. Yeah. Uh, when I asked her, Grandma, you know, what's, what's a so-and-so? And her reply would always be, well, you know a such-and-such. -such. <laughs> well, it's the same, only different. And then she would explain how it was like them and how it was different. Do you think this is a very important way of understanding things? Uh, it's a very important way of understanding the relation, say, between the theory of evolution and other things that we would call simply history. Um, and I would say between, between cosmology and what we would call metaphysics. Um, and between what we would now call psychology and what we would call philosophy of mind. In some ways they're the same, in other ways they're different. We should also look for Continuity is to think of scientific with traditional knowledge. Um, I use this example, I'm afraid, because, well, we used to have, in my garden in England, we had foxgloves. They grew, they were weeds. They grew all the time. Um, cure for heart disease in the olden days used to be ashed up foxgloves. Turns out they contain jutalis, which is now an ingredient in conventional heart medicines. And you can hardly open the newspaper without finding you know, some other folk remedy turns out to have something in it where modern medicine has the advantage in terms of understanding what it is, what's the active ingredient, what's the relevant dose, and so on. But the knowledge was there in some sense already. Um, I think if you say no to demarcation, which is my intent, you know, say I'd rather not. Like, like Bartleby, you know, I would prefer not to, as, as Mr. Bartleby says. I would prefer not to. But if you do that, you realize Pop is onto something, and he didn't know what it was. He misidentified. What did he misidentify? Look, willingness to take negative evidence seriously is very important. It's the mark of the honest inquirer. It's not 
the mark of the scientist. It's the mark of the honest inquirer, whether he be scientist, historian, etc. Um, if you read Darwin's autobiography, you'll find that he, he says, among other many interesting things, he, used, he kept a special notebook for negative evidence in which he would write down the things that he couldn't explain. The, the evidence that came here way that seemed to pull against his theory. And when people ask, well, why do you have a special notebook for negative evidence? He replies, well, I, f I remember the positive evidence. Which I think psychologically is very shrewd. That's exactly right. This is confirmation bias, right, as we would now say. We remember the positive evidence. We notice the positive evidence, but we need to remind ourselves of the negative evidence. But this isn't just a mark of the honest scientist. It's the mark of the honest inquirer of any kind. Um, once in version number one of a paper about what federal courts have made out of Popper's philosophy, oh my goodness, I said, so far as I'm aware, there is no case in which any court has refused to admit psychiatric testimony on Popperian grounds of unfalsifiability of, of analytic theory. Wrong! Uh, I'd said this. I said it in class. I had to go back the next week and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Uh, I have found one case. <laughs> there is one case where I can say with confidence that the judge had actually read one page of Popper. And on that one page, he discovered psychoanalysis is bunk not science, and good, he could get rid of this stuff. Okay. Moreover, I think a theory is ruling something out is a mark of its being genuinely explanatory. It's not a mark of its being scientific theory. It's a mark of it actually explaining something. If it doesn't rule anything out, it's no explanation at all. Okay. So it's not that I think Popper wasn't onto something. I think he misidentified what he was onto. Now, the consequence of, of saying I would prefer not to to the question of, of location is it obliges you to do something other than just look down your nose at pseudoscience. Um, I'm actually on the board of, of the outfit that publishes the Skeptical Inquirer. I don't know if you know that magazine here, do you? Yeah. Which, apart from its preoccupation with, with Bigfoot and stuff, um, does contain some quite interesting material sometimes. But one of the things that really annoys me about that magazine is its tendency to say, ah, this is pseudoscience. <coughs> don't tell you anything. Except we don't like it. Right? I want to know what's wrong with it exactly. And if you've said no to demarcation, then you're obliged to say, not just, well, this isn't science, it's pseudoscience, but what's wrong with it? For example, it's too big to explain anything. It uses mathematical symbols or graphs or tables or whatever. They're just decoration. It makes purely speculative claims as if they were well warranted. These are all serious objections. It's pseudoscientific. It's just a sneer. Uh, I would say, for example, about creation science, which is still, um, I don't know if it is in Canada, but it's a non-negligible deal still in the States. Right? There are moves to introduce it into science classes in Louisiana, even as we speak. Right? They're, they're working it. They didn't have enough money for new books last year, but it's a new year now, and they might. And we might we have What's wrong with creation science? Well, I want to say, first of all, it's, it rules out nothing. You know, it wouldn't matter if there were two varieties of beetle, or two million or two trillion, the explanation would be the same. God made it. And moreover, as far as I can tell, there is no real inquiry going on in this field at all. It's just reassertion. Okay. So. Right. Fourth sign of scientism, the quest for scientific method. I'm going to deal with this in a way quite quickly because I assume some of what I will say will be familiar to almost all of you. 
Um, you, I'm sure you know that there's been this ongoing search to articulate the scientific method. Is it inductive? Is it deductive? Is it probabilistic? Is it Bayesian? Is it, what is it? Uh, this came to a head, a tail. It came to a something, some kind of crisis. Um, when, when Feyerabend was opening all the doors and the windows of the lecture room at the LSE and pronounced the only principle that will not impede the progress of science is anything goes. Uh, since then, I think we've made some, people have made some progress. Small, slow. But first, I thought maybe there isn't a constant scientific method. Maybe there isn't a single science. There are, after all, many sciences. Maybe there isn't. Okay. This is my take on that bunch of issues. Okay. First of all, Percy Bridgman got it right um, a long time ago. This is 1949. If you don't know him, read him. Nobel Prize winning physicist, so very serious scientist, who also wrote some simply wonderful stuff about science and society. Really good. Um, like I just took a nice cool shower and I'm really refreshed stuff. Um, on the, so famous, there's a stamp with his face on it in Togoland. Um, <laughs> I got a nice email about defending science from KwaZulu last year, but this is even better. This is much better. Um, he writes about the scientific method like this. There is a lot of ballyhoo about scientific method, he says. Um, and it seems to me that the people who make the most noise about it are the people who do the least about it. That, uh, you know, if you want to find a really big fat chapter on methodology, look at a really big fat bad book on sociology. What he was uh, seems to me, he went on, the scientific method, insofar as it is a method, is doing one's damnedest with one's mind. No holds barred. That's right. Of course, it's not a philosophical theory or even story. Um, here's my take on it, which I, I think, having read quite a lot of Bridgman, um, is not actually false to what may have been said. Of course, underlying procedures and inferences are used by anybody who's seriously trying to figure out something about the world. I would put them roughly like this. Well, something puzzling. You make, you make, make, make the best, guess, best informed guess you can about what the explanation might be. You figure out what the consequences would be if that were true. And then you check all the evidence that's available to you. And all the evidence you can lay hands on if you exert yourself. You use your best judgment whether to dump that guess and try again. That's the Popperian maneuver. Um, modify the guess so that it's compatible with the evidence you've got so far. Or stick with the guess that you made in the first place and feel more confident in it than you did before. You can call that the hypothetical deductive method if you like. I don't mind. Uh, but it's not unique to scientists. It's what I do when I try to figure out you know, that whether, why did the dish that I cooked this, this week and then previously, five weeks ago, come out better this time? Well, it's exactly the process I go through when I try to figure that out. We all use that. That is not used only by scientists. And then there are special scientific techniques and tools. I mean, Things like instruments, microscopes, telescopes, questionnaires, doo -doo 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 -doo. and things like models and metaphors, which I see as aids to the imagination. Um, mathematical and logical and statistical techniques for making sense of large quantities of data. And social arrangements that, up to a point, are not whole and most of the time, but not him, not perfectly, keep people honest. Okay, so there are these different helps to inquiry. Well, these are often local, yet they belong to one area of science. 
sociologist doesn't really need a microscope. Uh, an astron an astron uh, astronomer is not going to have much use for a questionnaire. <laughs> but, okay, so they're local. So they're not used by all scientists. They're also constantly evolving. An um, absolutely wonderful book um, about the evolution of medical imaging technology. Um, Betty Ann Kevler's Naked to the Bone. Um, one of the things that's so wonderful about it is presents you know, the, the, the theory about how x-rays work in terms so straightforward and clear that anybody, including myself, who has absolutely no mechanical ability whatsoever can figure out, OK, I understand how that works. OK, now you understand, you understand how that works. Well, you understand how a movie works, right? It's a lot of pictures that go by. That's how we make moving pictures. You understand what a contrast medium is? OK, and she can get you from. Um, the original x-ray to the MRI in a few chapters. And you're actually thinking, hey, I understand how all this technology works. You also realize it doesn't say the same for 10 minutes. They're improving it every day. Okay. So the first thing isn't used only by scientists. The second bunch of things isn't used by all scientists. But you put them together, you begin to understand how the sciences have done as well as they have. Okay. And why there's a temptation to talk about an evolving scientific method, or local scientific methods, and so on. Um, I use this thought as a way into the question about the social sciences. Same method, different method. Oh, the same, only different. That was one of the contexts in which I used this phrase. Um, of course, they use the same underlying patterns. Everybody does. Everybody who inquires does. Um, like the natural sciences, they will benefit if they can set up internal mechanisms. Oh, dang. Oh, God, never mind. If they can set up internal mechanisms that will, yes, if you don't mind, that will, will keep people honest so that they've not been nearly as good as the natural sciences so far. Um, I think you went forward. It's getting, getting worse and worse. So go the other way. One more. OK. But normally, the social sciences use very different tools and techniques, special helps to inquiry. Helps to inquiry, by the way, is Bacon's phrase. I read Francis Bacon by accident, by the way. Um, I was asked to teach the class on empiricism um, on the entirely spurious grounds that this has to be taught every five years or it will go off the books. Um, spurious because I that it was not taught for 10 years. But, um, <laughs> I figured anyone who can read English has to be able to teach the empiricists. But my first mistake was to think that Bacon was one of them. <laughs> uh, this was the one of the best mistakes I ever made, because I learned so much from reading this proto-pragmatist, as, as I now see. Okay. All right. Fifth sign, looking to the sciences for answers beyond their scope. Um, of course, there are many questions within the sciences which are not yet answered. There are also plenty you can't ask yet. Unfortunately, I can't give you an example of one of those for obvious logical reasons. Um, I can give you an example of what used to be one of those. Before the concept of macromolecule, which we can identify when that was, 1922, I think. Um, before we had that concept, the question about um, whether mad cow disease might be caused by badly folded uh, protein atoms in the brain, that was not un askable, forget answerable, because nobody had a concept that enabled them to pose the question, might the structure matter as well as the, the composition of the, the molecule? And there are also many legitimate questions, legal questions, literary questions, culinary questions, and philosophical questions, which are not within the scope of the sciences to answer. Um, I think it's scientism to expect the science to answer them. Uh, now I'm treading into deep and murky water, literally. Uh, there are plenty of sciences, um, environmental sciences comes first to mind, but others too, which bear on policy. The environmental 
environmental scientist might be able to tell you what the consequences would be if you dam this river. You know, you'll get this many more crops from these fields and this much electricity and yada, 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 and we'll lose the purple spotted frog or whatever it is. Uh, nevertheless, I take real scientific inquiry to be, by its nature, policy neutral. That's to say, it's relevant to those questions, but it won't answer them for you. Um, if you're doing something else different from scientific inquiry, like we say, and I don't know whether you use this phrase, advocacy research. I want to say advocacy research. So it's not really, by my lights, quite much at all. Um, real scientific inquiry, unlike advocacy research, is policy neutral. This doesn't mean an environmental scientist can't have views about whether you should dam the river. Of course not. It doesn't mean he may not say in public, I think we should dam the river. Of course he may. What it means is he, might, he should not say in public, I'm an environmental scientist and I've got a PhD and I'm telling you, qua environmental scientist, that we should dam this river. Um, I once had a really interesting conversation with the chair of environmental sciences at the University of Virginia on precisely this question. And he said, that's exactly what I try to do. I say, qua environmental scientist, I can tell you, if you do this, this will be different. Qua citizen, I tell you, damn the river. <laughs> uh, but he said, I keep changing hats whenever I do. And I said, good for you. Um, and thank you for telling me this because it makes me think I'm not crazy. Okay. This suggests a very simple conclusion. Results from the sciences can tell us what means and relations. They can't tell us what ends are desirable. Do you think that's true as far as it goes? But it doesn't go very far. And the really, really, really hard question is, yes, but does science have any bearing on value questions? at all. This is, this is a nightmare of, of you know, bog of, of many, many questions, very hard to disentangle. Um, I'm just going to say a few seriously intended but not deeply articulated things. Dewey wrote in 1929 that the problem of restoring integration between science and values is the deepest problem of modern life. I think that's as true today as it was in 1929. What he meant was, we've inherited an epistemology and a philosophy of science which derives from a completely different culture and a completely different idea of scientific inquiry. We're now living in an age when the model of cognitive success is the natural sciences. We need to get our thinking about values somehow or other better coordinated. Um, when I teach my class on science and values, the first class always says, and how many of you thought that this is going to be about bioethics? Um, well, you may leave now. Because <laughs> um, the first thing I want to say to you is there are lots of kinds of values. Epistemological, uh, yes, aesthetic, political, economic legal, religious, etc., etc., etc. I then try to work my way systematically through this list. Uh, here, I'm actually trying to try to say something about the relevance of the sciences to ethical values. Um, this is not my usual ice, and it's probably pretty thin, but yeah, it's okay. It seems to be in between those two. What makes some scientific work relevant? though not sufficient to answer ethical questions, is that you can't entirely divorce what's good for human beings do from what's good for humans. That's the thought that lies behind my intermediate position. Um, and of course, this means if, if you need to know what's good for humans, biology, Sociology, economics may have a bearing on ethical 
questions. Do I dare give you this, this example? Um, it's both a little too personal and a little bit raunchy, but never mind, I'll try. Um, at home, uh, that I bought for my husband. Uh, I was away, I was in Milan at the time of his birthday. And I wanted to buy him something sort of cute and Italian, you, you, you know. Um, what did I buy him? I bought him a book of photographs of penguins. Penguins, as you may know, are touchingly monogamous creatures. And the book was called Amora. It's got these marvelous pictures of you know, penguins looking after each other <laughs> with, with their arms, the, the, the baby penguins, and so on. It's very sweet. Um, there's, there's a philosophical point behind this. He knew I was making it, of course. Um, besides the obvious, the obvious. Um, seems to me it's relevant to questions about sexual morality among us humans. Whether we humans are in fact kind of like penguins, or more like bonobos, <laughs> who are, you know, delightful creatures as far as I can tell, who very rarely fight and are in many ways admirable, but will screw anything moves. <laughs> now, this is an empirical question. And maybe the answer is some of us are like bonobos and some of us are like penguin. And this would explain a lot of problems. But okay, who knows? But it's an empirical question. That's about the relation between science. Okay. Uh, here's a, an easy example of scientism on this question. An easy but scary example. A recent paper in The Lancet which argues that adolescents and young people should priority in medical treatment over both infants and older people. Most of you are probably OK. Um, I'm getting a bit nervous, frankly. Uh, and if any of you have babies at home, you should be nervous too. Uh, what the heck's the reason given for this? Empirical surveys show that most people think that this is best. Well, excuse me, but this, this is ridiculous. Most people think this is best, does not, to say the least, imply this is best. I wonder by the way, the empirical surveys turned out to be two, one of them unpublished, and neither of them actually showed what was claimed. Um, that was an easy example. Um, one of the authors was one of President Obama's advisors on medical policy, which is kind of scary. More complicated, much more interesting, much more difficult example. That book of, of E.O. Wilson's called Consilience. Um, I'm very happy he, re he reintroduced the word. It's a very good word, and the concept is very important. Uh, but it seems to me that this is really two books, not one. I, I, I've, I've used it in class. It nearly made me crazy. Uh, and in the end, I, finally, after weeks and weeks, I, I, I emerged from this, saying, oh, now I get it. It's two books. This explains why I didn't know whether to say. It's a really good book, but it's a really bad good book. Or, as I wanted to say on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, this is a really bad book, but it's a really good bad book. It's ambiguous all the way through. On one interpretation, he, he claims that an evolutionary account of the moral sentiments is all that's needed. You've got that, you've got ethics, the rest is irrelevant. That's scientism, moreover, it's false. On the other interpretation, all he's saying is that biology is relevant, not sufficient. That's true, and it's not scientistic. The only problem is it wouldn't sell a million copies. Uh, when you think about it, um, his subtitle is ambiguous in exactly the same way. It took me a long while to figure out what was, what was so strange about this book. But look, the unity of knowledge has two interpretations. All knowledge must fit together. There can't be incompatible knowledges. That's right, there can't. All knowledge must fit together. All truth must be, in the end, coherent. All must be reducible to science and preferably to evolutionary biology. That false. And the whole book is a sort of tangle. These two 
ideas worked out in different contexts, which is why I feel so ambivalent about it. It's an excellent book. Denigrating the non-scientific, my last sign. Stephen Weinberg writes, science demystified the world. That's right. Um, not, not everybody, of course, has got demystified. Do you have in Canada those absolutely bizarre television programs about mediums and ghosts and angels and things? There are scads of them. And stuff. They must have a huge audience. What they seem to me to show is that people love a mystery. You know, they really love the mysterious. They're sort of upset when something mysterious gets explained. But why not right? Um, there are a lot of things that people used to worry about, like the design of the human eye, the design of the universe. I think the sciences have shown us these are bad questions. Don't ask. They were. But flow from that, and I don't think it's true that science can eventually displace every other kind of inquiry. That doesn't follow. Um, here's an example. Um, empirical legal studies are fashionable, at least in the States. Sometimes they're very useful. Sometimes they're pretty poor, but sometimes they're very useful. Look, it's very important to know if this information is available. Whether, for example, if a state dumps the death penalty, you understand some of the states in the US have the death penalty, some don't. And from time to time, a state will change its position. If we knew whether, when this state dumps the death penalty, the murder rate shot up, went down, remained roughly the same, this is very important information to determining whether or not it's worth having the death penalty. Because at a minimum, one of the things it's supposed to is make per people commit fewer horrible murders. And if we can discover it doesn't do that, then that's a reason for getting rid of it. Okay. So I'm all in favor of well-conducted empirical studies. You understand, of course, they're very hard because the situation is never exactly the same in every other respect. And taking that into account makes the world it's very complicated. Still, because you, you know, to do an empirical legal study, you actually need, you know, empirical stuff and distance to go around getting information and money. And deans always prefer, seems to me, work that requires money. <laughs> it has a methodology as opposed to, I'm going to sit and think about it and then we'll see what happens. So empirical legal studies are becoming more and more and more fashionable. They're not inherently any better than traditional legal scholarship. Right? They're potentially useful as a supplement, but they're not inherently better. Um, I think it's not only scientific to think scientific inquiry is inherently better than other kinds. It's also scientific to also scientism to think our capacity for inquiry is inherently more important than our human capacity of storing, telling, singing, dancing, painting, cooking, etc. Uh, I, I've I actually spent an entire chapter of defending science on the relation between science and literature. And I think you know, it's important to realize there are similarities as well as differences. Um, this this um, analogy I actually owe to Professor Magotti. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that, but I'll also say what I used first before he suggested this more, more presentable one. Um, which is more important, science or literature? He suggested, this, is a, this is a bad question. Right? There is no answer. Um, he suggested, which is more important, a sense of justice or a sense of humor? Excellent. I wouldn't be without either. Um, the thing I had in the first draft, which this reprised was, would you rather be blind or deaf? To which my answer is no thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, concluding thought. Oh. Um, all right, modern science arose in Europe. Okay. It's just a fact. It was the work mostly of white men. Some critics have concluded science is a white man thing. I think this is very silly. 
there were many anticipations of what we call modern science in China, where astronomical observations from centuries ago are actually still relied on by modern astronomers because they tell you what the sky looked like then. Uh, in the Arab world, think of the vocabulary of, of chemistry, of science, actually, um, from, from alkali to zenith, Arabic roots to these scientific words. There are now capable scientists of every race, every conceivable gender. I want to say science isn't a white male thing. It's a human thing. It's one of the things we humans do. <coughs> I always wanted to say this, but <coughs> it got wonderfully underscored. Last year, um, no, the year before, I gave a talk at the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel, which was for me simply wonderful. So it's a medical research institute. Friedrich Miescher was the guy who first identified the stuff we now call DNA. And he is Basel's most famous scientist by far. Uh, of course, long dead. <laughs> okay. And at this institute, where I, I talked about issues with science and the law, uh, afterwards I talked with some of the graduate students. And what I was most struck by was a three cornered conversation myself, a young woman from Canada, and a young man from Uzbekistan. The cultural difference between that young woman and that young man could not have been, it could have been larger, but it couldn't have been much larger. I, mean, I remember asking both of them, you know, do you intend to, to continue to work in England or in Europe, or do you intend to go back to your home countries? And the young Canadian woman said she thought she would go back to Canada. And the young man from Uzbekistan says, well, it depends what my wife wants to do. If she wants to stay, Tashkent, we will stay in Tashkent. But if she wants to come to Europe, we will come to Europe. And I said, do you have any idea what she's... I said, no, I haven't seen her yet. <laughs> um, it turned out, he was getting married the week after he went home to a woman he had never met and where he went to work with. So the cultural difference is vast. But get them talking about science. And I was the outsider saying, no, explain that to me. You, you see what I mean. A human thing. Okay. Now, of course, modern science is also relatively recent, and sometimes people resist it. Um, sometimes I think this resistance is very unreasonable. Um, I'm very annoyed with the prominent in Indian social scientists who thought um, old-fashioned variolation is better because it's more traditional than modern scientific smallpox vaccination. Um, the old practice, which involves using live smallpox matter and lots of prayers to the goddess of smallpox, uh, is about 10 times more likely to give the patient smallpox. Uh, so this seems to me terribly unreasonable resistance. I don't think the resistance is always unreasonable. Um, sometimes it's very hard to distinguish globalization, urbanization, industrialization, the rise of scientific, who knows? But sometimes when you know, you've got old traditions that get wiped out by new scientific stuff, and something's lost, something whose value is lost. So examples, they're not very deep. Um, the Panari Indians in Venezuela used to use stone axes to clear forest so that they could plant crops. It was hard to clear a forest with a stone axe. So you'd have to have the whole village out there. And there's a whole bunch of folk songs and stuff with the right, you know, the right rhythm. Or ding, pew, 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 so that you eventually you get the tree cut with your stone axes. It takes a long time, but you all work together. There are social values here. They got lost when they gave them steel axes, and one guy could do it. And in the US, um, richer people than I sometimes employ Amish builders on the grounds that they, though they won't use electricity, they don't have phones. They're very expensive because you employ a middleman with a phone to go get them. Uh, but they actually still understand craftsmanship. They can do a house that will stand for hundreds of years. And people who are rich enough employ them to build their houses for them. Uh, 
Um, because I made these for China, I drew pictures to explain who the Amish are, but I assume that's not necessary. These are the plain Amish today. Um, and you know, we all complain. <laughs> Students have the vast resources of the internet. You know, they're so lucky. They have no idea what it was like before there were Xerox machines. God, I'm beginning to sound like my grandfather. <laughs> they don't know what it was like. There weren't, didn't used to be Xerox machines. If you wanted a copy of a paper, you had to make a copy of a paper. Then. But we complain. They don't remember how to read a book anymore. Right? One of my colleagues, uh, a literature, uh, sorry, a religion professor, actually teaches a course where the whole point is every student has to read a whole entire book. And this is shocking to me. Um, almost everybody in this room has probably benefited from medical advances. Um, I, among you, uh, a year ago I was blind in my left eye. I can see better in my left eye than I could have seen, than I could ever have seen since I was seven years old. That, um, however, wouldn't have been so short-sighted were it not for the fact that I got the measles when I was seven. Had I been vaccinated against the measles, you see what I mean? I have every reason to be grateful for the advance of science. Um, I think we all also feel some unease about how impersonal it is. Um, I saw my eye surgeon for a sum total of exactly six minutes. <laughs> if you're undergoing eye surgery, you need it to be quick. But there's something terribly impersonal about that. In short, to forget that the technological advances that science brings, though they've improved and extended our lives, have come at a real cost in terms of traditional practice, traditional skills. That's itself a kind of scientism. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, we have time for two or three questions. So. Open it up. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question about questions. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that you ruled out some questions, bad questions, which mm -hmm. should be asked. Uh, but I wonder if there should be an inquiry about subject questions and the difference of questions. And maybe, or maybe not. Questions. Um, okay. I've thought about this from one angle only. Um, it's the angle that, um, that comes up in my own work a lot. This is why it, you know, it's, it's been, for me, not an exercise in itself, but a means to an end. Um, I think that a very common source of bad philosophical questions, um, which is probably in itself a partial explanation of recurrent complaint metaphysics is meaningless, right? is some kinds of question are bad, they presuppose something false. Uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the hackneyed example is, have you stopped beating your wife? Right? Which, you know, your best bet is not to answer it, because if you say yes, if you say no, it implies that you used to beat your wife. Uh, but philosophical questions, I think, more often are based on the assumption that this and this are the only options. Right? They're based on Dewey would have called untenable dualisms, and I might be more inclined to call a false dichotomy. Uh, I think this is a very, very common source of bad philosophical questions. Um, you'll notice it's not to do with structure. It's to do with content. Right? But it's not to do with logical implications. It's to do with presuppositions. Um, so there, there is... I mean, there are things to be said about what that relation is. 
Um, there are also things to be said about you know, the ways in which dichotomies can be false. You, you see what I mean? That's, that's the line of thought about questions that I've explored. You know, not, not in any paper I can point to, I'm afraid, but as, as a thing that comes up in my work often. You know, why am I objecting to this question? Well, it presupposes something that's false. Take my question, and the question about scientific method, right, which I think is best at least reformulated. Right. I would say that the false presupposition behind the quest for the scientific method with a capital S and a capital M was something like there is some procedure or some mode of inference which is used by all scientists and only by scientists, the use of which explains how the sciences have been as successful as they have. Right. And I think it's, that presupposition is false. Now, it doesn't mean there's nothing to be said about this question. I think I mean, I've said something. Right. Namely, I can explain how the sciences have been as successful as they have. <laughs> but it's not something that presupposes those claims. Right. Um, I don't have any general theory about questions. I have um, a you know, considerable trail of worry about particular philosophical questions and of discovering, I think, what's wrong with them is a false presupposition of false dichotomy. Um, so first thing, okay, I've always been uneasy with it. That's the first thing to say. Um, I didn't know much about the history of this um, practice until the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, got the idea that whether scientific work was peer-reviewed and published was a good indication of whether it was reliable. Okay. Um, federal judges were very unclear what to make of this. And it turned out when you looked, you didn't have to look very far to discover there was an ambiguity in what the court said about peer which was affecting everything legally. There are two possible meanings. One is pre-publication peer review, which is the Oh, an academic would ordinarily understand it. The other is, a paper is published by whatever means it's published out there. Other scientists read it. Um, some of them may notice flaws in the study design or a mistake in the calculations or something. Others may try to put on the results and find it doesn't hold up. Or they may fail to find any flaws in the design or any mistakes in the calculations, and they may try to build on the results, and guess what? This is working out really well. And eventually, the idea will or won't have this process of peer review in a much broader sense. One of the legal problems was that the Supreme Court wasn't clear which of these it meant. Right? Uh, it's easy for a judge to tell whether or not the thing underwent the peer review process before being published tells you about how reliable it is. It's that it would survive long-run scrutiny of the scientific community is actually a very good indication it's reliable. But you know, a scientist doesn't know that for a federal judge. Right? So this ambiguity is legally quite consequential. Anyway, interested in what was going on in the courts, I, guess, I began looking into the history of the peer review system. First thing I discovered, it is remarkably recent. You can trace it back to the 18th century, but it didn't become standard practice at scientific journals until after World War II. And it didn't become standard practice at non-scientific journals until it had acquired the status that it acquired in the sciences first. Okay. Uh, and it clearly came into existence for a good sociological reason. Before the Second World War, 
there, were, there was more space in journals than there were articles waiting to be published. After the war, suddenly, there was more stuff wanting to be published and not enough room for it, so we needed some way of discriminating. Okay. Now, another thing I discovered was um, American legal plans are extremely about what peer review involves. They think, probably because law reviews are not peer reviewed, they're student edited. Right? And the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Right? They think scientists who are asked to review a paper go away and reproduce the experiments and check whether they get the same results. <laughs> uh, they are very shocked when I tell them, look, there have been studies of how much time a scientist will spend peer reviewing a paper. This means reading it, thinking about it, writing up his comments, filling out the form that the journal will require, you know, checking whether it's got this and this and this and this. 2.4 hours. Um, very rarely, very, very rarely, anybody check the statistical calculations. Even check whether the statistical methods were used that the article says were used. Uh, this turns out to have been not the case in one of the important Vioxx studies. They said we're using myth this methodology and they weren't. Right, okay? So even in the sciences, this is, you know, at best it's a sort of cheap and cheerful way of you do your best, but you can't possibly tell how reliable it is. It has a lot to do with how interesting it is, um, how well written it is, how intelligible it is, uh, how new it is. Right? There's, there's a strong bias in favor of the positive, the new, right? the exciting. And this is in the sciences, where by and large and on the whole, um, except in certain areas, especially in the natural sciences, but in the natural sciences at least, on the whole the sciences are not sort of divided into schools and cliques and so you, you see what I mean. Um, mostly the reviews are probably giving it their best honest shot. Not always, but mostly. It may be more or less competent, but they're giving it their best epistemological shot. As soon as a field gets cliquey or school-ridden, you get a different kind of problem. You see it in psychology, for example. Um, I can see it in economics, where I'm occasionally asked to referee things. Um, why, you may ask. That was my question, too. But um, the institutional economists who are in the minority, substantial minority, have been very much influenced by pragmatist philosophy, and I'm sometimes asked to referee work in this genre. And it's very clear that there are schools in economics, and if you send this paper to an institutional economist, he'll say, this is great stuff. And if you send it to someone who does mathematical models, he'll say, well, where are the symbols? There's not, nothing in there. This is, this is floppy. You, you see what I mean. And in philosophy, we've got the problem of schools and, and whatnot. And the problem of clique, I'm very conscious of the epistemology clique, for example, or cliques, where everybody refers to everybody else. You know what I mean. Um, I was asked to, referee, asked to suggest a referee for a paper last year. Abstract began like this. X, 2009, semicolon, forthcoming, close parenthesis, comma, Y, 2007 semicolon, forthcoming, close parenthesis, mm -hmm. comma, and Z, 2009, semicolon, forthcoming, close parenthesis, comma, have argued that, <laughs> sorry, knowledge requires intellectual ability. Gee, well, who knew that, right? <laughs> Seems to me this is, I, this is either trivial or false, but anyway. <laughs> uh, w, however, has offered a counterexample. I think, my God, this is a clique. It's X, Y, Z, and W are writing about each other, and they're all publishing all over the place and refereeing each other's papers. And this poor sucker got, got unlucky. 
and got someone who wasn't a member of the clique. But you can see how all this stuff keeps getting published because right? I've also noticed that you, know, you, you reach a certain level of visibility and journals keep sending you papers which are about you. <laughs> and this, I think, is a temptation to terrible dishonesty. Right? I've, I've many times said, you know, I'm very flattered that they think that what I did is useful in this area. They might even be right. Uh, but honestly, I can't say I think this is publishable because look at all these difficulties, about, you know, the understanding of it, the application of it. So I think philosophy is at you know, the far end of the continuum of how reliable a quality control you can expect um, peer review to be. I also think the appearance that we operate by peer review is up to a point an illusion. Um, there is this matter of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> frequent flyer miles can upgrade to publication by invitation. Right. And we don't know. I mean, those of us who are not, you know, if, we know, if you're not privy to what, what goes on, um, we don't know which of the papers in peer-reviewed journals were actually peer-reviewed because some of them will have been invited. Right? Um, I think philosophy is actually at the, you know, the far end of this continuum. Peer review works very poorly and in fact is not doing as much of the work as people think it is, especially the younger people think it is because they're not in a position to know better. Uh, I don't know what the... I, mean, look, I can remember before peer review was a big deal in philosophy. Right. Um, no, I don't remember when Woodbines were sixpence a packet, but <laughs> I do remember when Gilbert Ryle was the editor of Mind and the decisions about what was to appear in Mind were made by Gilbert Ryle. They were idiosyncratic. Um, they were biased towards give a young person from the far-flung corners of the British Commonwealth a chance. Right, you know, he, he sort of liked the paper from New Zealand who never published before. Give him, a, give him a shot. Was Mind a worse journal then than now? I don't think so. Right. Um, it was different. Um, perhaps there was more really bad stuff, but it was also more interesting. I, I, have, I have no solution to this problem. I'm just, I think it's time that some of us who can afford said out loud, this system is not sacred. And moreover, it really doesn't work particularly well. Um, it does have a way of imposing a kind of orthodoxy. Uh, not to mention an absolutely dismal style. <laughs> if, you, if you read analytic philosophy these days, it could almost all have been written by the same person. <laughs> and, People, you know, the, the copy editors keep trying to correct punctuation and, and they'd say, you know, you, you can't say that. It's, it's not sort of official enough. And I want to say, well, why not? I want to say what I think. And this is what I think. If I, want, if I say this is very silly, I want to correct this to you. know, I, I think that this is mistaken. No, I think this is just silly. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? I think this has had bad effects on philosophy. Um, of course, it's part of a much larger syndrome. OK, now let me get to the syndrome. Um, look, in the olden days, oh god, I'm beginning to sound as if I'm 150. I'm really not. But I, can, I can remember when he was a member of the faculty, a senior member of the faculty, who would say, oh, all right, I will do it for three years. It's a pain in the neck, because I really want to write that book. But all right, I'll do it. Somebody's got to do it. The trains have to run time. We can't have these two compulsory clauses conflicting with each other. Somebody's got to do it. All right, I'll do it. A dean who intended to return to the faculty um, shortly and who was a member of the faculty recently knew what the pitfalls of intellectual work were. Right? He wasn't an expert in every area, but he had some way of using his own judgment. He had his own judgment to use. 
he could smell a fake if he was any good. Now, I don't know how it is in Canada, but what we have in the United States is an ever-growing class of professional administrators on a professional track from chair to dean to provost to university president. I've simply lost touch with the life of the mind. It's sort of inevitable if you get on that track. You're involved in raising money and impressing donors in impressing your bosses with, you know, the centers you founded, the, the, the stars you hired, and all that. Right? They can't use their own judgment. This is why peer review is so important. They have to rely on something else, the way federal judges do. So they hand it off. And one of the things they hand it off to is, was this thing peer reviewed? Right? It became more important because of pressures which had nothing to do with its power to discriminate good work from bad. That's the point. Okay. Well, I've seen more questions out there, but I'm afraid our time has, has come to a close. So please join me in thanking.